Hello everyone. Today our topic of discussion is assessment of volume status and volume responsiveness on the floors and in ICU setting. As we all know that uh, sometimes it is very difficult to assess the volume status of the patient uh, based on the clinical situation. And uh, to give you an idea, we'll go over a case uh, to get a good pic to get a good picture that why the assessment of volume status is difficult sometime. So let's look at the clinical situation. So we have a 65 year old male who has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease with stent a year ago, COPD, CHF, last echo 40%, patient is morbidly obese, has obstructive sleep apnea, pulmonary hypertension, pancreatitis. So patient is presented to the ED with cough, shortness of breath, abdominal pain and diarrhea for three to four days. So in the ED, patient was hypotensive with blood pressure 80 over 45. Rest of the vitals were okay. Initial CBC show elevated white cells. BMP was normal. Lactic acid was high, 4.5. And chest X-ray show bilateral pneumonia. CT of the abdomen was done. This showed colitis. So patient was started on IV fluid, IV antibiotic, and received the fluid of 5 liter in the ED based on sepsis protocol. After the fluid resuscitation, patient complained of abdominal distension, art line was placed, and CVP was 15 millimeter of AG. Due to increased work of breathing, patient was intubated in the ED, and the repeat vitals are, so temperature is 37.3, heart rate is 101, respiratory rate is 23 per minute, Blood pressure is still low, 85 over 56. Oxygen saturation 90% on vent with a PEEP of 8, FIO2 40%, tidal volume 500. Repeat lactic acid was done and it came back 5. So the question is, does this patient need more fluid or not? So our topic of discussion uh, assessment of volume status and volume responsiveness on the floor and in ICU patients. So the question is, does this patient need fluid? So why we should give more fluid in this clinical situation? Why? Number one, patient is septic. Number two, patient is still hypotensive because blood pressure was 85 over 50. Patient is still hypotensive. Third, lactic acid is still high. Lactic acid is five. Why we should not give more fluid? Because this patient has history of CHF. Patient has history of coronary artery disease. CVP is 15 millimeter of HG. Patient already received five liter fluid in the ED. So that's our topic of discussion today, how to assess the volume status and volume responsiveness in patient uh, you see on the floor and in ICU. So let's move on to our topic of discussion, assessment of volume status and volume responsiveness. So there is no single test available to accurately determine the volume status of the patient. So you have to look at the whole clinical situation and different tests together to make the final decision about the volume status. So let's look at all those tests uh, one by one on the floors and in ICU. So first you'll take a detailed history and your focus should be on intake and output. So you will, especially in old patient, you will ask about input, uh, are they drinking enough water? Uh, because in old age, sometimes the patients don't drink. Uh, you'll ask about the output and history of vomiting, diarrhea, polyuria, bleeding, 
GI bleed. Are they taking any medication which can which can cause polyuria like diuretics? So detailed history about input and output is important. You will do the physical exam, quick physical exam. Uh, based on, so you'll start with vitals. You will look at the blood pressure, which will give you some idea. Maybe patient is dehydrated. If the blood pressure is low, look at the heart rate. Patient will be tachycardic if dehydrated. And then based on evidence, you will do the physical exam for volume status on three different sites. You'll check the skin below clavicle. You'll check the skin tinting. If the skin tinting is lasting more than two seconds, patient is dehydrated. You will look at the tongue. You will look at tongue furrowing. If uh, you'll see, if you are seeing more than three furrows on the tongue, patient likely dehydrated. And you will feel the axilla. So normally the axilla are slightly wet, but if the axilla, both the axilla are dry, uh, patient might be dehydrated. You look at all the medications, especially diuretics. Moving on to basic blood work, you will look at the CBC. If patient has no history of anemia in the past, and if, if you have past CBC available, uh, look at the hematocrit, which will give you some idea. Uh, patient might be dry if hematocrit is high. You will look at PMP. Look at the sodium level. Uh, though it's not absolute, but uh, it will give you some idea about the volume status. Uh, look at BUN, creatinine. Look at the ratio to you might get some idea about the volume status. Patient might be dry. Look at the urine analysis. You have to look at specific gravity. Normal specific gravity is 1.010. If it is high, patient is, patient is dry. If it is low, patient is wet, possibly wet, or uh, patient uh, has polydipsia. Uh, look at the chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is not showing any fluid, chest x-ray is normal, no pleural effusion, no pulmonary edema, likely dry. You can also check urine lights. You can check urine sodium uh, and different uh, sources. You will see different numbers, uh, urine sodium less than 15, less than 20. So you can pick uh, urine sodium if it is less than 20. A uh, patient might be dehydrated, trying to retain more sodium. Uh, chloride usually goes with sodium. So urine chloride, less than 20. Possibly patient is dehydrated. Fina, fractional excretion of sodium, less than 1%. Uh, it's a pre-renal cause. Uh, kidney is not getting enough perfusion. Patient is likely dry. You can give more fluid. If the patient is on diuretic, then FINA will not be accurate. So in that situation, you can check fractional insertion of uric urea. And if it is less than 35%, likely the pre-renal cause, patient possibly dehydrated, you can give more fluid. And when I say in terms of FINA and fractional insertion of urea is more of a pre-renal cause, uh, I should not say dehydration. Uh, pre-renal mean they might have, C they, it can be because of CHF2, uh, but it can be because of dehydration too, uh, if it fits in the right clinical situation. Fractionalization of uric acid, less than 12%. Patient likely, likely fluid responsive. This patient might be fluid responsive. If lactic acid is high, that also indicate uh, poor perfusion of the tissue uh, might improve with more fluid. Next is assessment uh, of fluid responsiveness in patient in ICU or critically ill patient. So there are different parameters. Uh, sometimes we use static parameters and there are dynamic parameters. Uh, the static parameters are central venous pressure, 
pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. But the routine use of CVP, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, or estimated end diastolic volume is not recommended these days because they do not accurately reflect volume responsiveness or intravascular volume status, even if you are using them in combination. So we don't use CVP or pulmonary artery occlusion pressure these days based on randomized trial and systemic reviews because they do not accurately reflect volume responsiveness or intravascular volume status, even if you are using them in combination. So the next thing is dynamic parameters. So we mostly use dynamic parameters. Uh, so pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, plethysmography variation index, and end excretory occlusion test. So when we talk about pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, plethysmography variation index, this specifically predicts left ventricular volume responsiveness only. This specifically predicts left ventricular volume responsiveness only. I will not go into the physiology of these tests, um, but if the pulse pressure variation is greater than 13%, stroke volume variation is greater than 10%, and plethysmography variation index greater than 10 to 15 percent that indicate volume responsiveness. So these three tests, pulse pressure, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, and plethysmography variation index, they indicate left ventricular volume responsiveness only. But if you want to find out about both right and left ventricular volume responsiveness, then you have another test called an expiratory occlusion test. So this test is used to determine both right ventricle and left ventricular volume responsiveness. So what you apparently do is, uh, so patient will be ventilated and you will uh, do an expiratory hold for 15 seconds. Patient will be on vent. So when you do the expiratory hold, uh, preload to the right and left ventricular increase. And if both right and left ventricular, if they're volume responsive, then pulse pressure variation, then basically pulse pressure, stroke volume and cardiac index increase by more than 5%. And if it increased by more than 5%, that indicate volume responsiveness. What are the limitations of dynamic parameters? So patients need to be in sinus rhythm. Number one. Uh, so patient have to be completely passive with no respiratory effort and patient should be getting tidal volume of eight ml per kg. Ideal body weight, which is not possible in most of the ICU patient because we try to use uh, less tidal volume. Patient should not have pulmonary hypertension. Patient should not have right ventricular dysfunction. So these are the limitations of dynamic parameters. Sometime critical care physician, uh, they can do tidal volume challenge test, tidal volume challenge. So during this test, they can uh, basically increase the tidal volume to eight ml per kg ideal body weight, and they'll do it for a minute. Patient will be on vent, and then they will check pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. And uh, in the appropriate clinical setting, uh, if they are increasing, then patient can they can assess uh, the volume status or volume responsiveness of the patient. So if you cannot do tidal volume challenge, uh, then there is another test called passive leg raising test. So passive le leg raising test retains 
its accuracy regardless of respiratory effort, tidal volume, uh, level of sedation, or arrhythmia. So patient uh, will still retain its accuracy. This test will still retain its accuracy about volume responsiveness uh, regardless of tidal volume, level of sedation, or arrhythmia. So what you have to do is patient will be lying supine and you will lift the lift both the leg to 45 degree for about one to three minutes and if pulse pressure stroke volume and cardiac index increase by 12 to 15 percent it means that the patient is volume responsive what are the limitation of these tests if the patient has massive ascites abdominal compartment syndrome or severe pain uh, these are the limitation of passive leg raising test our last test is point of care ultrasound so you will be seeing ivc inferior vena cava variation of greater than 50 percent with respiration so if you are seeing ivc variation of more than 50 percent with respiration that indicate volume responsiveness so this was our topic for today thank you very much have a nice day